So first of all, welcome. It is really wonderful to see you all here. Uh, we are really thrilled you've come out for this pretty unique event, I think, in, in the history of this uh, department. Um, as a starting point, I just want to express my sincere thanks for coming out on such a gray and rainy day. Um, I can imagine the conversations that were happening, you know, 30, 60 minutes ago about it being a very long day, the weather sucks, you know, uh, partners and children are encouraging you not to go back out again this evening. Um, we had our 14 visiting speakers and uh, some of the conference organizers eating dinner over at Rackham a moment ago and just trying to get from Rackham over to this building. We already have our first casualty. Uh, Parnas and Gupta sprained her ankle. And uh, so uh, Rita Chen is taking her back to the Bell Tower Hotel. But we're hanging in there. Um, I, what we can promise you, I think, for coming out tonight in return is some really interesting conversation sparked by the ideas and experiences of our 14 returning U of M history PhD alums, all of whom I think you will discover very quickly um, have done some really remarkable, important work since they graduated from our program, some almost 30, 40 years ago, others within the last few years. Um, and while we were having dinner, welcoming these people back to campus, we went around the tables and gave people a chance to say a little bit about what they work on and what they do. And uh, I think I can promise you there's a very good reason to come out for these panels tomorrow. These are really amazing people who've done very important work. And as I said at dinner, this is a kind of collectivist, kind of crowdsourced enterprise. You know, there were nominations coming in from faculty and graduate students across this very large department. And so these are really interesting people that I think you will be very happy to hear from. This group of returning speakers includes film and television documentary makers, filmmakers, museum curators and educators, radio and podcast producers, Washington policy experts, journalists, bloggers, and digital humanists, accomplished diplomats and academic administrators, and public-facing scholars from many different kinds of universities and colleges. Tonight, we're going to begin this conference with a pair of keynotes by two deeply admired members of our community, Professor Earl Lewis and Professor Jackie Antonovich. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Jay Cook, and I have the honor and privilege of chairing one of the very best history departments in the world. Part of what made Part of what I think has made us so good for a long time now um, has been our willingness to bend and stretch and reinvent ourselves at various moments in our departmental history, to reconsider who we are, what we do, and how we do it as a collective enterprise. And as a starting point, I think I would just throw out there the proposition that we're at one of these kind of pivotal moments where U of M history is thinking very self-consciously, very collectively, about the ways in which we train, thinking about you know, ways to redefine, reconfigure that training in response to kind of wider things going on in the world and in the discipline. What you're about to witness tonight, starting tonight and over this two-day conference devoted um, to this process is a, a kind of exercise in ambitious stretching, stock taking, and strategizing our collective future as a PhD program. Over my own 18 years at U of M, I've participated in dozens of remarkable conferences here that have pushed the conventional boundaries of our discipline. In my own case, that's included uh, conferences on the state of cultural history as a field, um, what we have described as the new materialism. But this one will be the very first conference, at least in my own experience, devoted less to subfield topics or historiographical arguments than the broader ways in which we train and support our talented PhD students, the ways in which we translate our expertise across multiple contexts and public sectors, and the ways in which we produce crucial knowledge for broader publics well beyond the cozy confines of academic specialties. This is really basic bedrock stuff, right? The ways in which we conceptualize our PhD program, the ways in which we produce knowledge, the ways in which we train. 
entitled U of M History and the Public Service, A Vision for the Humanities, PhD in the 21st Century. Our goal for this conference is to explore three principal areas. First, this big and baggy thing we like to call public engagement. Indeed, part of what we're after here is to be much clearer and more capacious about the different forms and approaches of our public-facing work and how that can operate in the context of humanities PhDs. Second, we want to explore the equally nebulous category known as career diversity, aka professional development. In this instance, we're defining it really as any form of professional development that bolsters the opportunities, the connections, the networks, and the resonance and impact of our talented PhD students. And finally, we want to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI, core values that cut across everything we do, but which also need to be much more carefully interwoven with both of the rubrics I just mentioned, that is, public engagement and career diversity. What we all know, I think, in one way or another from our collective experiences is that public engagement work and career diversity always includes deep and important DEI components. First, in the multiple paths that lead us all to graduate school, then in our diverse and variegated experiences as part of this top history PhD program, and then more broadly still, in the ways in which we strategize careers and hail different kinds of publics and communities um, with the work we do beyond graduate school in Ann Arbor. In a nutshell, that's the core agenda for this conference, for the panels you're about to hear. Before we dive into the introductions, though, let me offer some quick but heartfelt thank yous to the many generous friends and allies who helped to make this conference possible. First, I want to thank, uh, for their support of this national conference, we'd like to thank U of M's College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and Rackham Graduate School. And I really want to say Rackham especially. Rackham has been supportive to us in a number of different ways through their faculty and stu student ally programs. Uh, through the Early Movers program, where these posters that you see on the edges of the room were featured as part of a larger rollout of a, a major strategic initiative in uh, Rackham, where they're rethinking graduate training more broadly. We also want to thank a number of friends and partner units in the Humanities Division and Social Science who supported this unit. Um, DAS, the Department of African and African American Studies, American Culture, Comp Lit, Germanic Languages and Literatures, Middle Eastern Studies, Judaic Studies, the Residential College, Women's Studies, and the Institute for the Humanities. More locally, I want to single out and thank uh, Melanie Tanelian. There's Melanie, our uh, Public Engagement and Career Diversity Coordinator, Matt Lassiter and Rita Chin, who kind of launched these initiatives in Public Engagement and Career Diversity a couple of years ago. Uh, Chloe Thompson, our executive assistant, who's done enormous work bringing you all together into this room and the logistics for the 14 people who were flying in yesterday and today. Um, Greg Parker, our public engagement coordinator, who does incredible work all the time on behalf of the Eisenberg Institute and for this department. Elizabeth Collins, our events and outreach coordinator, who's running video in the back of this room. Also, David Hutchinson, and Michelle Mann, who are currently our Rackham student allies who've been serving as conference hosts and are centrally involved in initiatives coming out of this conference moving forward. Um, I should also just mention quickly um, Catherine and Gary Andrejack, who were here a moment ago. Uh, Kathy Andrejack is the daughter of our former colleague, Gerald Brown, who was a member of this department from the late 1940s to the early 1980s, gave a considerable gift to this department, which has been centrally involved in, in kind of launching these pilot programs. Daniela Scheinen, back there, who was our first Gerald Brown digital skills uh, PhD intern, and has created our remarkable new podcast program, The Reverb Effect, Please check it out if you haven't already. They were here a moment ago uh, for a little bit of dessert to say hi to Daniela, but didn't have the ability to stay this evening. Um, 
I'm going to save my own framing comments on these questions of public engagement, career diversity uh, for the conference as a whole for tomorrow morning. So I'll do that tomorrow before we get started at 9 a.m. Let me turn now to introductions for our esteemed colleagues, Earl Lewis, Drs. Earl Lewis and Jackie Antonovich, who will be delivering <coughs> tonight's keynote addresses. And I should just say at the beginning, this pairing of Earl and Jackie was very deliberate, very self-conscious. <laughs> what we were imagining when we were brainstorming this conference is that we thought, here we have two amazing people at different career stages who could help kind of frame these conversations and launch the larger set of issues that we want to talk about <laughs> tomorrow. Earl, as many of you know, has been in multiple positions of national administrative leadership, dean of Rackham, provost at Emory, president of the Mellon Foundation. He's basically been working on these issues for decades. And so we thought we would begin with Earl in a kind of high altitude, uh, kind of policy perspective, thinking about some of these questions based on his expertise and experiences uh, over the last 30 or 40 years. But we also wanted to hear from somebody who's really been moving through the profession recently. And Jackie finished in our program two years ago. She's a 2018 PhD. She's someone who was centrally involved in kind of early efforts in this department to get public history moving in a serious way at the graduate level. I'll say more about that in a moment. And has done some pretty remarkable work in the digital humanities with her nursing Cleo Brock blog. Um, let me start with Earl, and I should just say at the outset, um, Earl is not an easy person to introduce. His CV runs for over 31 single-space pages. There's very little fluff in those 31 pages. It's basically major achievements after one after another. So many, in fact, that one typically begins what I'm about to do with some kind of nervous joke about the impossibility of doing him any justice in four or five minutes. Um, for those of you who were here about a month ago for Earl's spectacular Eisenberg Institute talk, you heard one attempt at this by uh, our colleague John Carson. Um, let me see what I can do in five minutes. For those who were here for the Eisenberg talk, bear with me. I want to make sure that our visiting speakers who don't know Earl as well had a chance to hear you know, about what uh, he's worked on over the course of his career. Simply put, Dr. Earl Lewis is one of the most widely respected historians working today. His books are field-defining, and his uh, recent election as president of the Organization of American Historians further indicates his stature among his scholarly peers. His service in top administrative positions at Michigan, Emory, and the recent president of the Mellon Foundation means that he's been chosen to lead some of the nation's most prestigious institutions. At present, He's Distinguished University Professor at the University of Michigan, our highest honor for an individual faculty member with an appointment that cuts across no less than four different units, History, DAS, the Ford School, and his own Center for Social Solutions. Earl received his doctorate from the University of Minnesota in 1984. From there, it was on to his first academic position in the Department of Afro-American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. When I arrived there in uh, the fall of 1990, Earl's name was still up on the faculty roster. They hadn't uh, actually removed it yet. So I remember staring at this roster and wondering who this person was, Earl Lewis, who didn't seem to actually be around in the halls of Dwinell. Uh, that Earl was a rising star in his field soon became clear as the University of Michigan recruited him away from Berkeley with a tenured associate professorship offer in the Department of History and then the Center for Afro-American and African Studies, CAS. Dr. Lewis served as an associate professor in these units until 1995 when he was promoted to the rank of full professor. Dr. Lewis's scholarly contributions landed him a 2003 collegiate professorship at the University of Michigan, which he named after two colleagues whom he had recruited to the University of Michigan, Elsa Barkley Brown and Robin D.G. Kelly. In the fall of 1997, Dr. Lewis became the interim dean of the Rackham Graduate School, a position that was made permanent in 1998. Before all of this, however, Earl had already made a considerable mark as a historian, as a program builder, and as a collaborator. His first book, In Their Own Interests, University of California Press, 1991, was invaluable not only because it offered novel ways to think about local and community studies, 
but also as a blueprint for fresh and innovative research methods for the study of social history. Lewis follows with the historians Joe Trotter at Carnegie Mellon and Tara Hunter, now at Princeton University. These works, African Americans in the Industrial Age, a documentary history from 96, and African American Urban Experience, Historical to Contemporary, and His Comparative Perspectives 2004, help to give further definition to the field of African American urban history. Lewis's deeply collaborative approach to knowledge production appeared again in his jointly authored book with Heidi Ardrizoni, Love on Trial, An American Scandal in Black and White with W.W. W. Norton, 2001, an ambitious narrative of the race-defining 1925 Rhinelander annulment case in New York City. This was also a crossover book in several senses, published by a trade press, widely reviewed, and dealing much more with gender than in his previous work. In the years in which Dr. Lewis was building the scholarly profile, he was also embarking on what would become a remarkable administrative career. While serving as the co-PI with Joe Trotter on the prestigious grants from the Ford and Rockefeller Foundations that would support their collaborative work with Tara Hunter and others, Lewis was also directing CAS at the University of Michigan. From there, he continued to define new directions with other esteemed scholars. His edited collection with Robin Kelly, To Make Our World Anew, Oxford 2000, made its mark on academics and the lay public alike. It was a History Book of the Month Club selection and won the Gustavus Myers Outstanding Book Award in 2001. And the multi-volume Young Oxford History of African Americans that he edited with Robin Kelly includes works by influential historians such as Jim Grossman, Deborah Gray White, and Colin Palmer. His continued scholarly productivity, his abilities as a mentor, especially of graduate students and three of our returning alumni or former students of Earl's, um, along with his skill and experience as an administrator led directly to his selection and success as the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and the Dean of Rackham between 1998 and 2004. Our former U of M history colleague, George Sanchez, who worked closely with Earl during these years, notes that Earl was able to turn Rackham into an engine for excellence in graduate education, fueled by a commitment and passion for student diversity and preparing the next generation of faculty leaders. Sanchez also notes that because of this level of success, Earl became one of the most sought after administrators in the United States. He was named the provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at Emory in 2004, and in 2013, he became the first African-American president of the Mellon Foundation. Many of the grants that actually launched what we're doing in this department and in this room and have been working on over the last three years were originally Mellon grants that came under Earl's uh, presidency at Mellon. Earl left an indelible mark on the Mellon Foundation during his years as president, funding some of the first major grants in the digital humanities, and beefing up the commitment to the Mellon Mays undergraduate fellowship program. He's also been a major public intellectual, weighing in on some of the most pressing debates of our time. I don't have time to go into this at great length, but while Dean of Rackham, he contributed to public discussions of this university's historic affirmative action battle in a 2003 op-ed, Yesterday's Victory is Tomorrow's Challenge, and since, he's, and since then, he's offered vital historical context to many other key debates in the public sphere, such as what role the humanities should play in higher education. For example, founding the funding the humanities, what story do we want to tell in The Guardian in London, as well as controversial political events, such as his recent op-ed with Nancy Cantor after Charlottesville. He's also... Uh, along with Nancy Cantor, produced an important edited volume and book series entitled Our Compelling Interests, The Value of Diversity for Democracy and a Prosperous Society. We are very fortunate then that Earl decided to return to the University of Michigan two years ago as the founding director of our new Center for Social Solutions. On a personal note, I just want to mention two things. One was that a couple of years ago, I had uh, dinner with a colleague in the English department, Carrie Larson, who was an associate dean under Earl when he was at Rackham, and he said one of the things you've got to understand about Earl is that there are certain administrators who are always four or five steps ahead of everybody else. He said Earl is one of those people. I've come to appreciate that in the time that I've worked with him. I also just want to say more locally, he's been an incredibly generous and supportive partner on everything you're about to hear tonight 
and tomorrow. In some ways, it was like a gift from the heavens, right, to have Earl return right at the moment that we were working seriously on these issues. So with that, let me turn it over to Earl, and then I'll introduce Jackie uh, after Earl's done with his talk. <laughs>